Okay, welcome back. RadioFire.com. You're Shuli Dominique in here. Special guest in the building. Jarden, how you doing? Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you. How have you been? I am well. You been good? How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, no complaints. Uh, no complaints at all. Um, so here in Baltimore, it's always something going on. And uh, for the last almost week, Residents at the Poe Homes uh, have been without water. Some have, have received water, some have not. And I wanted to talk to somebody who was on the front lines with this whole thing. Uh, so we are joined by Jamee. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I guess, so first, let's start with who you are and what you do. What do I do? What don't I do would be an easy question. Um, yeah, so to keep it short, uh, I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Brooklyn Baltimore, and we work with youth throughout Baltimore City in grades K through 12. Um, and I'm just an advocate for young people, an advocate for those who don't have a voice, who don't know what resources are available, and just really a community advocate and um, just being out here supporting the community in any way that I can. Okay. All right. And so with with that, um, a few days ago, uh, well, I guess almost a week now, uh, this community where the Poe Homes is located had a, a crisis. So how did you become involved in this uh, crisis? Um, actually, I, so yes, it has been a week. They um, went without water last Monday, so it's been a week now. And um, I just got a, someone reached out to me via inbox to bring the, uh, the situation to my attention. And in the beginning, it was just, a, hey, these people need some water donated. Um, so I'm like, okay, we can do that. I'll get some people to donate some water. But then after, you know, really finding out what was going on, it was more than just a water situation. Hmm. Right. And um, so there were, do you know how many people became displaced? So there are 280 units, I believe, in Poe Homes. Right. So um, it's, it's a few hundred people um, are without water um, since Monday, and you know we're talking about 280 families, really, because these are families. Um, so it's quite a few. It's a few hundred. Right, and then people got to understand: without running water, we're talking about showers, washing machines. Uh, dishes, you know, clean, you know, cleaning the dishes and 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 that kind of stuff. And what were you gonna say, Yarda? And really, all facets of life. Right. Um, you were mentioning how you thought this was much more than a water issue. Could you tap into what else, you know, it actually uncovers? Um. So I mean, at, at this point, in the totality of it, it's a human rights issue because, like Don said, it's not just water is a lot. It's like you can't let the clothes or you can't bathe, you can't wash your dishes, you can't wash your clothes. So basically every human right that you have to, to be a person and be in the home company is stripped away from you when you don't have water. Right. It's like we're in a third world country or something. Right. And here we are in Baltimore with all of this money that they're putting into the city and we have people who have been without water for an entire week. Right. Right. Um, you know, I when when the situation first got on my radar, uh, it was because you brought it to my attention, uh, Jamee. And I started to research the Po homes and, you know, what was going on, because I've really been talking about the gentrification that's happening in in and around Baltimore. And so. This this particular uh, project is a 78-year-old building in West Baltimore. Last year, they got a $1.3 million grant from the Housing and Urban Development to revitalize that area. 
Uh, I think that they are heading towards privatization, which means a private company will own that and move the residents out. So when I saw this water uh, crisis go down, I just automatically assumed that this is part of the strategy to make it uncomfortable for the people there and slowly start to get this um, turned around like some other projects in in Baltimore have have happened. You know what I'm saying? That's what yeah. I that's that's what I thought. So this this development first opened in 1940. Okay, uh, so we're talking about uh, Lexington Street, Saratoga, um, and, and and that in that area. What what are some of the like you got a chance to speak with some of the residents? What what were they like? What was their mindset like? Um, in the beginning, I think a lot of the residents were. They were upset, but they were feeling hopeful because, you know, they were saying, oh, it'll be this point and by the end of Thursday. And I even heard from the executive director of HABC, uh, the councilman for that district, who is John Bullock, saying, oh, it will be restored by Thursday night. I have that in black and white and emails. So people were feeling a little bit hopeful that their water was going to be back on. Right. And then by Friday, when people realized, like, it's not going to be back on, people were disappointed. Um, people feel like the city has let them down. It's been more of a community effort to support this community. And, and at this point in the game right now, they're, they're getting restless. And um, it's a little worrisome. I, I completely understand why they would be restless. But it's a little worrisome because I feel like, like you said, um, you know, they're pushing people to a certain point that they want them to get to. Right. And the people are at that point where they're ready to be like, Listen, that's all it is. What's up? And um, I don't want to see that because, like you said, this is not just a whole big coincidence, a whole big accident. Right. It's definitely something that's systematic, and I, I just don't want the people to fall into the trap that they're laying for them. Yeah, and 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 I, I believe that if you if you remember a couple days before the Preakness, there was a water main break. Mm. In 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 uh, in front of the the um, you know Pimlico, mm-hmm. they fixed that within a few within a day. Oh wow! It was not. It was like boom, done. So um, you know, when talk about infrastructure, it's so difficult. They had to use a workaround and all this kind of stuff that nobody cares about. Just get it done, right? Mm-hmm. Right, uh, but they they can they can get done what they want to get done. So you mentioned the council, the council person in that area. Ha, has he been communicating? Has he been supportive? Is this what what is what has it been like dealing with him? Um, I personally have not had any had any conversation with John Bullock outside of him telling me that the water was going to be restored Thursday night, which it was and not. That, um, which it was not, and that was pretty much to the point of me calling people out on Facebook, like, what's going on? Hmm. Um, it's, it's a whole bunch of fluff. It's a whole bunch of fluff. Um, I've been down there since Thursday. I've been sitting down there for hours with residents, and they will tell you I've been down there. They pop in, and they, they, they're popping back out. Um, it, it's, not, it's not to my level of satisfaction. I'm, not, I'm a person that says all the time, like, don't just give me what you think I should have. I'm going to get what I know I should have. And they're just giving people at this point what they think they should have. That These council people and everybody else involved, they should be down there every day until this is resolved, not in and out, like down there helping, engaging, providing resources. Like, it's, it's, I'm not satisfied with it, and I know the residents are, aren't satisfied with it. And a lot of these residents don't even know who John Bullock is, so mm-hmm. that's enough to tell you that he hasn't been down there and responding in the way that he should yes. be. Yeah, so wh- whoever is uh, is going to be running against him when when that time comes needs to, um, you know, bring this to people's attention. Let's keep in mind, summertime, it's mm-hmm. hot, it's mm-hmm. steamy, mm-hmm. Uh, just normally draining on a normal day when we got water and all that kind of stuff. But imagine when you don't have those things that we take for granted. So since Monday, tomorrow will be one week. Yeah. You know, so um, from what I am understanding, uh, 24 residents still don't have water. Wow. Uh, yeah. 
So that is so you've been you've been doing what exactly when uh, with your uh, outreach? Yeah. Um, so the main thing I've been focusing on um, is providing residents with hotel rooms um, for them to be able to one get a good night's sleep, um, two be able to get up and use the bathroom and know the toilet is going to flush, be able to take a shower, and just have access to running water. Um, the first night, we housed them in the suite at the Marriott residence in over at John Hopkins. Um, the team at Marriott over there were awesome. They actually donated a suite for us um, to house the residents, and the others um, came from myself and people who made donations for that. And then we placed them in the Hilton, Hampton Inn, and we're going to be placing residents in the hotels tonight again. Um, so we've been helping about nine and ten families on average every night. Um, and then just being there to, um, I think people are forgetting that these are human beings, right? So, yes, they need donations. Yes, they need everything that we've been doing. But they need people to be there to say, listen, I'm here to support you. I'm I'm going to sit outside with you in the heat. I'm not, right. I don't like the heat. I'm not, I don't like being out in the sun, but. I sat out there for hours with my kids yesterday. I had them with me yesterday and actually Friday. Um, and we just sat out there for hours. We helped out on the grill. The kids were playing with the kids and just engaging them, selecting them. Like, we really care. We're not just here to drop off water, but to engage the people. So engaging the people, um, coordinating the people who have reached out to me, asking where they can bring donations to and getting people to come down and bring donations. So it's been a lot of organizing, a lot of support, but mainly making sure that uh, we have hotel rooms available for the families with really small children and for um, some of the senior citizens in the community. I, I wanted to touch on that because I noticed that you were doing more than um, having hotel suites and everything available for families. Um, even before then, you were on a grassroots level with some type of organization so that they can readily have um, water available. So I wanted to uh, touch on that as well, you know, that you've been doing things in addition and prior to that. My question that I want to kind of ask you is that, do you think the response would have been the same prior to this incident getting more press and like more notoriety and becoming a current topic, you know, within the city of Baltimore? Like before, there was not really much attention on this issue. And then towards, you know, the end when things were more, um, what word do I want to use? Dominique. Publicized? Yes, publicized. Yeah. Then yeah. it was like instant relief or it was a push and pull to bring relief. Um, to be very honest, if, if people weren't started to made aware of it and if the word wasn't getting out, it would have still been hushed because it was already hushed from Monday to Wednesday. Right. So Tuesday night, Thursday morning was the point where I was the first alerted and I started getting on social media and sending emails and being on the phone all day when people were like, oh, I didn't even, people didn't know this was going on. Right. No one knew because the residents, you know, sometimes people don't know how to advocate for themselves. They just think, oh, okay, well, they said 40 hours, we can tough it out. But then they started to realize, like, no, it's taking longer and we need some help and we have to go to social media and we have to start reaching out to people. So to answer your question, if people, if this wasn't starting to get out via social media and people out in the community getting on this topic, no, they would not have the response that they have now. And even the response that they're getting now that is out there is still half bad. Right. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're 100% right. Social media, very, very instrumental uh, in this. Any other organizations uh, that that you saw that you want to shout out or people that were um, supportive in this? Oh, God, there's so many. Like I said, the community support has been very, very overwhelming. Um, there's uh, uh, Michael Foy, uh, Eric Randall. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of people down there. Um, who else is down there? Elano from 300 Gangsters. Uh, some of uh, the local news people have been down there. It, I hate to, I said names, but it's been so many people that I can't even remember. Um, Kahan Dillon has been down there. He actually um, went in on a hotel room for the first night and sent money for water and food. He came down uh, Saturday, and I, prior to this, I didn't personally know him. Um, came down yesterday with his team and engaged. He was out there playing basketball with the kids. Um, so many people have been down there out to support. Um, for whatever reason, 
it doesn't matter. The community has come out to support. We had people sending donations from D.C., people just dropping stuff off. Um, I know Andrea Jones from Liz Hands Fire is down there today. So it's been quite a good amount of the com- uh, community support. Wow, that's that's um, that's really good. And then people don't know that you don't even live in Baltimore City. Yeah, I people do not know that I quietly moved out of Baltimore. Right. Um, I'm now a resident of the District of Columbia. So I'm about uh, from my house to downtown Baltimore, 295. I'm at the end of 295 on the other side. So I literally ride 295 from one end to the other to get into the city. Right. Um, so that, that's been a little tiring, just driving back Definitely. and forth. Um, just the drive alone in itself is tiring. But, you know, you, you got to step up and you got to help people that, that can't do it for themselves. That's the community it's all about. It's a collective effort. It's not, it's not a Baltimore issue right now. It's a huge, like I said, it's a human rights issue at this point. It doesn't matter where I live at. Um, these are people. And it could, be, it could have been my family. It could have been me. One of my friends that lives there, it can happen in D.C., it can happen in New York, it can happen anywhere. So it's a human issue at this point. It doesn't matter to me, you know, where it is. Again, you have to, when you're an advocate, you have to use your voice effectively whenever things happen, not just, you know, picking and choosing what you want to talk about, but helping people that need it. Right, right. Well, again, thank you. Uh, the people, as I told you, the, the residents are very lucky to have uh, someone that's advocating for them like you. Um, and you also got to keep in mind that you have a, a whole organization that you work with. You have a family as well. And, um, and you still find time to do this good work. Absolutely. Yeah, and thank you for you guys for um, bringing light to this. I did tag Diamond in this um, when I originally started talking about it and some other people because I think it's important that we bring the, the, the real story to the media outlets that we have because, you know, the news, the major news channels will get on and try to paint this picture like it's under control. And right. you, they control how they give the information to us. So I think it's important for those who have the media platforms to, to find out what's really going on and really shine light on what's happening to these people in, in the appropriate way. We just want to just... Just thank you. you know, like we're very appreciative. We want to know that your efforts do not go unnoticed. I mean, we just want to encourage you to keep on, you know, the good fight, and just just kind of encourage you and motivate you, you know, from the heart. Like it just takes a special kind of person to do this type of work. So, thank you. We appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Definitely, definitely. How can uh, people stay in touch with you? Um, I'm on social media. My my inbox is very overwhelming right now. I've been okay. trying to respond to everyone. <laughs> um, that, that's why I've kind of been doing the live update so I can just get one message out to multiple people because it's starting to drain me. My phone literally crashed on me last night because there was so much going on. But um, people can reach me via Facebook, Jamei Ebert. Um, I can be reached via email at jamei at brocobaltimore.org. Um, our website is brocobaltimore.org. Um, but, yeah, my inbox is always open. It might take me a while to respond, but I have been responding to everyone. Okay. Well, the um, thing about it is, is as the weather continues to go on, I think that we'll, there are going to be other situations like this in other areas uh, throughout the city. So I'm sure this is not going to be the last time. We speak about a subject like this. So, Dami yeah. is trying to tell you that you go ahead your hands full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was feeling that kind of vibe. I was feeling that kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because um, Perkins Perkins was also given a um, a grant, and I think that um, their water eventually is probably going to mysteriously uh, have an issue as well. So, that's my prediction. Yeah, I mean, it seems pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, thanks again, and thanks for taking time to talk with us. Absolutely. You guys have a good one. You too. Bye.